Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey, and I'm the Executive Director of APA Ohio and Vice Chair of the Norbanism Division, and I will be the moderator for today's webcast. Today, Friday, August 8th, we will hear the presentation, Participant Experience Design, New Communication Strategies for Effective Public Engagement. For technical help during today's webcast, type your questions in the chat box found in the webcast toolbar to the right of your screen or call the 1-800 number shown. For content questions related to the presentation, type those in the questions box also located in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen and we will answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. On your screen is a list of the sponsoring chapters and divisions. I would like to thank all of those participating sponsors for making these webcasts possible and free. Today's webcast is sponsored by the Colorado Chapter. To learn more about all of APA's chapters, visit planning.org slash chapters. And to learn about the divisions, visit planning.org slash divisions. Coming up on your screen is a list of upcoming webcasts. To register for these webcasts, visit utah-apa.org slash webcasts. You'll notice that our next webcast is August 15th, and you'll also notice it is not on the Utah website at this time. We are trying to, but our, our, our website coordinator is on vacation. So if you would like the direct link to it, please email us and we will be happy to get that to you. Okay. To log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, visit planning.org slash CM. Go to your dashboard, selecting activities by provider. Select the APA Colorado chapter. Select today's title. And you'll see on there is the event number two. This webcast has been approved for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing only. Some recorded webcasts are available for distance education CM credit. For availability of distance education credits, check the webcast webpage at utah-apa.org slash webcasts. Like us on Facebook Planning Webcast Series to receive up-to-date information on our upcoming sessions. And also the August 15th session is up on our Facebook page, so you can see that. We are recording today's webcast, and it will be available on our YouTube channel. Just search Planning Webcast Series on YouTube, and a PDF of the PowerPoint will be available at ohioplanning.org slash webcast presentations. I'd now like to introduce today's speakers. Daniela Ferguson is a principal at Modus Planning, Design, and Engagement in Vancouver, Canada. A community and stakeholder engagement practitioner, Daniela has a background in urban planning, design, political science, and web development. On the forefront of rapidly evolving digital engagement thinking and practice, Daniela is committed to helping organizations become more participatory, transparent, and accountable. Daniela has led numerous community planning and engagement projects in Canada and the U.S. and now provides training and tools that enhance and expand the field. Chris Haller is a nationally recognized user experience designer and online engagement strategist with an interdisciplinary background in local government, urban planning, and communication tech. He leads UIS in the development of interactive web and mobile apps and the designing of online engagement processes and social media strategies. He publishes the Engaging Cities online magazine and was named one of the top 25 thinkers in urban planning tech by Planetizen in 2011. Finally, Brad Barnett. As a program director at Place Matters, Brad focuses on how technology and communication design can support decision making. Brad brings a background using GIS, design, and data visualization as tools to better understand and communicate the complexity central to planning issues. Prior to Place Matters, he was part of a team at the Center for Sustainable Development at UT Austin, working to develop a software tool that allows Central Texas municipalities to model the impacts of land use and transportation investments as they work towards implementation of a regional plan. 
So with that, I would like to turn the screen over to our first presenter, Daniela Ferguson, who I just just to be safe, is in Vancouver, Canada, and is having some technical issues. So just bear with us if, if we lose her for a moment. We will get her back. <laughs> so, Daniela. Thanks, Christine. Um, actually, if you don't mind turning it over to, um, to Chris instead, the screen over to Chris, I think that would be a bit more reliable. You got it. Okay, thanks, Chris. All right. So thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Um, I appreciate you spending the time with us. Uh, Christine, go on to the next slide, please. So um, Christine gave a, a, a introduction to who I am. So I'm one of the five principles of MODIS Planning, Design, and Engagement. Uh, we're a mission-driven company based in Vancouver, Canada. And we focus on the planning, design, and implementation of sustainable and resilient communities through robust community and stakeholder engagement. We're a new company, but our team's been working together for about a decade on our shared mission. Um, so my background is uh, urban planning and political science, but I've had a hobby in web development since I was a kid. And at MODIS, I lead our digital engagement practice, working with developers and local governments on engaging stakeholders and, and the public on long-range and current planning issues. So just a heads up, um, in my presentation, you're going to see lots of examples from Western Canada. And our planning framework is a little bit different here. But the tactics that we use to engage the public and the issues that we're talking about and the underlying principles, I'm, I'm sure, will apply in your jurisdictions as well. So next slide. Thank you. Um, so last year, uh, we hosted a series of discussions um, in Canada about what if Apple designed community plans. Uh, so this, this picture that you're seeing on the slide um, is from an open space workshop that we held at the Canadian Institute of Planners National planning conference, so that's our Canadian version of APA, and we had uh, student planners, community activists, um, user experience and design professionals, legal experts, and engagement practitioners all coming together to imagine what if Apple designed community plans. Apple is famous for creating products that are easy to use and intuitive, um, interactive, engagement, engaging, and forward thinking, and what if we could apply that to our policy document? Um, what, what kind of documents would we get, and would they even be documents in the first place? So these, um, these workshops resulted in some really interesting implications about what it means to be a planner in the digital age. So in, in this short presentation, I'm going to highlight some of the findings that we found from these dialogues and raise issues for what this could mean for us as planners. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a snapshot of the results that we um, heard. Uh, we got 10 big ideas. There's the 10 circles in five categories, which are the five colors. Um, so the five categories were format and design. You know, how can we format and design policy documents differently to, to have a better user experience? Um, how can we do our engagement processes better to uh, um, get more and better inputs and create better plans as a result? Um, how can we communicate with our public and stakeholders better not only to get them involved in processes, but also to share with them the results and how government services work, uh, planning processes, and even just governance in general. So content was um, what ways can we show the information in other ways than just text. And other were some other big ideas about um, improving civics education uh, and linking our physical places to virtual places. So um, the next couple of slides are some high-level snapshots of what we heard and example projects, what is, how this could be done. So in the format and design categories, one of the quotes that the participants shared was, put the 10 most important directions in the plan up front on one big page. So th this idea is um, rather than having a, a document that's got a uh, big idea spread throughout its 80 pages or 300 pages or however long your policy document might end up being, uh, can we create something that's like a table of contents but even more engaging than that? So the next slide shows an example of how this could be done. Uh, oh dear, sorry, that's a bit blurry, but um, what this image <laughs> shows is uh, 10 big moves for a downtown plan in uh, Mission, British Columbia. 
um, you'll see some circles there that have numbers, and those numbers basically summarize the whole policy document in uh, 10 points. And so um, this was the very first page of the plan. Uh, it's basically the plan table of contents, and it makes an attractive and handy printout for the permitting and approval staff, um, as well as elected officials, to focus on the plan's outcomes um, as they evaluate um, planning applications. So keeping the so the, I guess the purpose of this document of this image is not only to orient people to the document, but also to focus um, focus us on what we're trying to achieve when we make decisions. Um, if you were to do this online, you could use um, clickable images, maybe on a website, so that people could just um, select the, the big move that they're most interested in and see which relevant policies apply. The next slide, please. Also under format and design, we heard uh, visuals don't need to be sophisticated. The next slide. So this idea is, um, we heard that graphics are really important to, to communicating planning concepts. Um, but you don't have to use really slick graphics to get there. Uh, so what the image you see on your screen is um, an example of a whiteboard video. Um, we've been producing quite a lot of these in the past two years. Um, this particular one was for uh, an official community plan in Gibsons, which is a small community on, um, on Vancouver's coast. And uh, because the graphics are kind of sketchy, um, they're not too slick. It doesn't feel like a, a sales or advertising video. It feels a lot more authentic. And so, um, in fact, having non-sophisticated graphics, having graphics that feel um, a bit more uh, hand-drawn and, um, and rough can create the feeling that something's more authentic and that there's more, the discussion, the door is open for more discussion and more interpretation. So next slide, please. So moving over into the process category, uh, we heard always be available to discuss a plan. Large group meetings don't work for everyone. And so this idea is that not only are people not always available in the time and place um, that you've set up for a meeting, uh, but also some people don't like being in big group settings and maybe they prefer one-on-one -on -one or small group discussions. Next slide, please. So what you see here is an image um, of a community booth that we set up in the District of Sparwood, which is another BC community. And um, th th there's lots of ways that you can do this, and I'm sure that many of you already do this great work. The idea of uh, finding out when the community events are, you know, barbecues, farmers markets, um, school registration night, and setting up a tent there, and just at least, at the very least, making people aware that you are doing some, some work where there's an opportunity to get involved and um, if you can, getting the feedback while you're there. So um, uh, you'll see a couple of slides uh, towards the rest of this presentation that involve going out into the community and meeting people where they feel comfortable to get their input. Um, just, but I did want to, um, to highlight that. So next slide, please. This image um, shows some community ambassadors. They are hired summer students who, um, who come, sorry, excuse me. They are hired community ambassadors and they, uh, their role is to go to farmers markets, county fairs, sit on buses, grab people in the streets, and uh, get them to fill out short and light community surveys. Um, so the people on the right, you can't really see it, but they're holding an iPad. And um, we've used iPads with MetroQuest surveys and other kinds of surveys uh, to get people involved. And we often can get um, at least 5% of the population responding to a questionnaire. Um, and this is great, especially when we're working with older populations where um, we find that lots of people can use iPads, but sometimes people need a little bit of extra help uh, for figuring out an online tool and how to get involved. Next slide, please. All right, so moving into the third category, communication. Um, this one says, bring all of the pieces together in a graphically useful way, i.e. the vision and goals. Um, so what this idea was saying is that, uh, is there a way that you can graphically show how the vision and the goals, objectives, policies all connect together um, to, to, to step back and see the whole picture as one. Sometimes in policy documents, it's easy to get caught up in the details and, and recite this bigger picture, literally. <laughs> so next slide, please. Oh, sorry, this one's blurry too. But um, the, what you're seeing here is, um, is, is a, an output from graphic facilitation. And so what this image is, is that uh, we had a meeting 
in the District North of Vancouver for their long range community plan. And uh, we already had uh, the vision and goals set up, but we were coming up with um, action to help achieve those vision and goals, and also un uncovering some opportunities and challenges at the same time. And a graphic facilitator uh, listened to those discussions and drew out a very large image. It's about uh, four feet tall by 10 feet across. And this image served to ground the process in the future and became part of the plan. Um, the, the larger idea, so when we had these group discussions about how, what if Apple designed an OCP, the larger idea was what if um, the user can choose the format in which they want to receive the information um, the, with the users being people like developers, staff, elected officials, partner agencies, and community groups. What if they could choose to look at text, a video, an app, a 3D model, or an image, and then understand the policy in the format that was most useful for them? So um, in a conventional way of doing this would be graphic facilitation, which is the example on your screen. Uh, but if you were uh, to do this online, you could use maybe a website with clickable images, um, like the first example I showed you with the, the 10 big moves from the Mission Downtown Plan. OK, next slide. So we've got one more in the communications category. Um, this is, uh, how can we bring the plan into physical space using augmented reality to illustrate future land uses? The idea is here is um, how can we bring all this extra information we know about place um, that exists either in documents or websites or in the online world, um, but make them accessible in actual places. The next slide uh, is a conventional example of how we do this as planners. Um, so this image is showing um, a workshop from Fort St. John's downtown plan. Um, there's a scale map with models that shows uh, what the future build out density massing could be. Um, but to do this online, um, you could have a 3D model uh, to show what the future conditions might be. But um, we could even do more. So what if uh, we had, you know how there's building audio tours, often for lead buildings, and people call a number, and they hear about its fe features, or when you go to a museum tour, you listen to an audio guide. Um, what if we could do something like that with a mobile app? Uh, heads up, you hold your iPad app and then you see an overlay of the future build out on top of the camera image of what it's showing you. Or what if um, we could use Google Glass or some kind of virtual reality to show people on the street what the future development could be like. That would be a way of combining the physical space with, real, uh, with, um, with the virtual space. Next slide. So getting towards the end of the examples here. Uh, so storytelling was our um, next category. And uh, this was a very popular category. We heard uh, allow, encourage, and support people to tell their own story. Next slide. So in a conventional way to do this uh, is to talk about people's values. So on the left, um, a tactic we often use is called hopes and fears. Um, it's an example where we ask people to tell us about their hopes and fears for the future. It could be um, a development process. Or it could be a, even in a meeting, if it's a particularly contentious meeting, and this helps people um, explain what they value most um, quickly and see what other people value most or are concerned about. And then on the right-hand side, I've got an example. Um, this was at a large community event. We had a camera person and a camera booth set up. Um, and uh, we were dressed up in energy hero costumes, superhero costumes, and we asked people to tell us the story of what made them an energy superhero. We took their picture and used a whiteboard to um, they could write their messages. And not only did this make really great web content so that we could um, show the pe people's testimonials about why they're an energy hero on our website and change the content around a lot, but also photo booths are really exciting ways to get people involved and come and see what you're up to. And uh, we also combined it with an online photo contest. Uh, Tumblr, Facebook, and Instagram are really great tools for doing that. Next slide, please. So another way to get people to tell you their stories is um, to use a big walkabout map and do a community asset mapping exercise. Um, this can be done online. with uh, There's quite a lot of online tools that can do this, but uh, we've used MetroQuest for it before. Uh, Yushahidi is a, another tool that is emerging that I think would work for online asset mapping. And um, the great reason um, for using this type of tool is that people can see that you're listening to them 
and valuing their local knowledge as you form policy. Next slide, please. Um, the last example I'll show you is storytelling is uh, of fill-in-the-blank campaign. So I've been really inspired by Candy Chang and the great work that she's been doing in community building. Um, so we had this uh, big vinyl poster up at the community event and we asked people to tell us what they wanted their community to be like in the future. And we combined that with a Twitter and Facebook campaign with the same fill in the blank question. Next slide please. So the last category is other um, and uh, it was hard to summarize what, what we heard but I just picked out one quote which was uh, how can we improve communities understanding of local government? So this big meaty question about uh, basically, how, how do we help people be good civic, um, good citizens and, and, and engage them civically? Next slide, please. Uh, so in, sometimes we think of interact as, uh, sorry, as education as being a, a one-way one street that we tell people and hope that they understand that education, of course, can be interactive, uh, something we encounter a lot in our um, engagement on planning issues is that community members want a lot of services with no new taxes and it's hard to have your cake and eat it. So we use a lot of participatory budgeting techniques to show that trade-offs must be made, um, that, that there are limits to what government can provide um, with their fixed budgets. So the, the picture that you're seeing here is, is an example of something we call sustain a box and people are given 10 tokens and then they can spend their tokens in as many buckets as they want um, and that helps us understand community prior priorities and helps the participants um, think with a, with a budget, you know, what if you were mayor for the day. You can do this online. Um, there's lots and lots of tutorial budgeting tools um, that can make this fun and easy and interactive to use. Next slide, please. So I'm just about to wrap up. Um, the lessons that we learned from listening to, to planners and designers and engagement people about what if Apple designed community plans was that people learn by reading, listening, seeing, doing, there's all these different kinds of ways of learning. Um, and so does do our plans really accommodate this? That's a question we should ask ourselves as planners. The next point was that people respond emotionally and that storytelling is really powerful. So does, does your plan tell a values-based story that your target audience, uh, whether it's planners, um, community activists, partner agencies, can, can they relate to that story? Um, focusing on outcomes is a priority that we heard. Does the plan address and describe the intent and outcome that you want to achieve with the policy? And, and how would the effectiveness of the plan be measured? Attention spans are getting shorter, so can we grab people's messages ac across, uh, can we give, grab people's attention and get the message across at a glance or in a few minutes? And so graphics, videos, choose your own adventure style documents are a great way for dealing with shorter attention spans. And uh, lastly, but definitely not least, is that online does not replace face-to-face. Uh, how can you do both? We like to think of online as augmenting um, what we do face to face and reaching out to people who, more, more and more diverse people who might not be able to come to an event that we host. And uh, the last slide is, so what does this mean for us as planners? Um, I'd say that we're generalists already. Um, we, as planners, we, we wear a lot of hats and it's a lot to ask for us to add more hats into the mix. But we're living in a digital age, so can we add graphic design, communication, public engagement and web development skills into this mix? How can we be great storytellers? Um, how can we sh show the impacts of different policy options using scenario models, virtual tours or graphics? And, and how can we become proficient in using web-based software? Um, second point is, is for planners is if we think about who we're trying to um, reach with our, our plans and policies, who are those users and how are they going to use those documents? That might help us decide how we decide to write and organize them. And then finally, um, I know the budgets are tight and resources are short and our time is really stretched so it's hard to do everything, but is there a way that we can efficiently use a variety of formats and communication channels, uh, so graphics or even websites, nonlinear browsing navigation formats uh, to, to help explain our plans and policies in more succinct and more flexible ways. So some questions to think about, and I'm really looking forward to hearing Chris and Brad talk about their examples of online tools and how they relate to planning and engagement. And I'm now going to turn it over to Chris. Okay, thanks Ooh. very much. Yeah, no, I think that's a 
perfect introduction, also perfect segue um, to look at some of these things in a little more um, detail, which is really sort of what my next presentation is going to focus on. Um, we have um, just one second here. Um, All right. Um, basically, what I want to do uh, is go uh, sort of talk a little bit about our experience uh, and look at a couple of different options here. Um, basically, the topic of participant experience design and sort of uh, the communication strategies, um, how to make them more, uh, to use new communication strategies to make public engagement more effective is something that at Urban Arctic Studio here has really sort of uh, for the last couple of years fascinated us and, and driven a lot of our projects. And I think we've come to a point where we wanted to um, really uh, look at how to uh, bring this sort of to a broader um, sort of approach and, and identify a couple of um, sort of building blocks on how we can do this more effectively. And I'm sorry because I'm a little irritated that my screen is not full screen, but um, bear with me. I think we'll just have to look at it this way. Um, Danielle already pointed out that a lot of the um, the tools we're looking at, or has, has pointed out a lot of the face-to-face -face approaches uh, that sort of have become best practices and, and sort of how we have, have built on those and on making these very engaging, very um, user-friendly and um, very effective. And um, one of the things that strikes us is that on the um, online side of things, um, we have not been as effective. I, I feel like there's a, a good amount of sort of emerging tools and I think we have really come to a point where a lot of the discussion and crowdsourcing tools and survey tools have become very effective and we've used those um, in, in, in ways and see those in more ways apply. But the part that I still feel we haven't really um, touched on and, and we have started doing more effectively is uh, this content-centered engagement piece. What do we do with the plan documents that we have? What do we do with the um, the, uh, the draft reports, the 50-page um, sort of um, state of the region reports? How can we bring those to life? How can we make the engagement around these more uh, fun and engaging? And what we traditionally see here sort of are the, the usual suspects. I would say we ask people to come to the page on the city website or on our project website and post a large document, a large PDF that might be, you know, 50 megabytes to download and take quite a while. And then um, we hope that people take the time to actually read through everything, which we likely know that only a fraction of participants will actually go uh, to that and uh, do that at full length. And, and, and then we hope that they sort of participate on SurveyMonkey survey and really sort of use what they just learned and, and provide the feedback that we're asking them for. And uh, what we found is that um, sort of on this great um, hierarchy of needs for user interaction design that, that we've come across in our work, that most of those are really sort of on the bottom. I don't know if you can see this very well, but on the bottom we have sort of things that are functional and reliable. This is often where we find sort of web, uh, the, the content that we provide in our projects and where we find uh, some of the engagement um, to happen. Um, rarely ever do we see things move up this ladder, like uh, that sort of continues with usable and convenient in the middle. And then um, we have sort of these meaningful and pleasurable experiences on the top. And Daniela highlighted quite a few of those in the um, face-to-face um, setting where we can make these things really um, fun and engaging. Um, but on the, on the online side, um, we oftentimes have this sort of a barrier where many of or most of our um, uh, experience, uh, uh, most of the activities that we provide and the content that we provide sort of remains in this functional and reliable level but doesn't sort of get higher up and become sort of fun and engaging as, as Daniela pointed out. And so where do we go and look for inspiration? Um, one of the fields uh, online that has emerged, especially when you think about sort of what inspires and drives the uh, apps that are uh, that you have installed on your smartphone and the um, things, the games that uh, we play online, um, what, 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 that, what makes them, um, uh, what drives them and makes them better. So it's this whole field uh, of user experience design that has a couple of different sort of areas and usability is one key here. You saw that on the hierarchy of needs chart where 
um, how can we present and provide uh, content and, and how do we structure engagement activities online in a way that they're easy to understand. A great book here is uh, by Steve Cook called Don't Make Me Think and I think that summarizes it well. It's like how can we structure things so that they're easier to do, uh, sort of providing, as Daniela pointed out, the Apple experience of uh, something that's plain and simple to use without much instruction rather than something that's very wordy, something that's sort of not very pleasant to, to sort of navigate and look at. And, and so there's a lot to be sort of inspiration to be taken here. Another sort of emerging part of this field is called gamification. So the process of game thinking, game mechanics to engage users and solve problems. And um, the the what we take away from this, um, oftentimes at first glance when you start looking into this is sort of the, the question like, wait a second, we are planners and, and we don't, like our content typically doesn't lend itself to different participation levels. This is not Angry Birds or um, uh, some of the other tools that we might be playing uh, or games that we might be playing on our iPad and there's no badges to be earned and these kinds of things. How do these things apply? And, and so as we uh, sort of dive deeper into this, one of the things that for us was a big inspiration was a company called Scavenger had put together this um, card deck of game dynamics where they really sort of looked at a, a wide variety of different um, tactics and dynamics that can be used to make games fun. And, and we're looking here at really sort of any kind of game from the board game you play at home uh, to an online um, sort of an, an app that you install on your phone to something as a sort of uh, uh, more elaborate that, that sort of gamers would play in, in sort of virtual worlds online and things like that. And so um, we uh, sort of reflected on our work that we've been doing with our Pipe Pages um, app over the last year where we've sort of built uh, interactive interfaces and, and games for around planning uh, documents and, and, and planning challenges and, and kind of really wanted to uh, go through, and that's kind of the inspiration for this presentation, sort of kind of rethink uh, sort of the, the bigger building blocks and, and sort of making this uh, sort of available or, and, and hopefully expanding this with your help to come to a, a point where we can build uh, and translate sort of our content more and more effectively into an online environment and making it fun and engaging. So I want to look at two big pieces here. So one is um, sort of how do we present complex information and later on how do we engage users and participants around that and really want to look at a quick example and then kind of dissect it. So one of the challenges we were presented with earlier this year was um, the um, Plan East Tennessee region went through a regional planning uh, process and came up at the end with this idea of presenting their findings and uh, their strategies and, uh, in a way that is uh, fun and engaging, what they call the playbook. And they wanted to make sure that this playbook is not just traditionally printed um, in a, and, and provided as a PDF, but something that is fun to explore on all kinds of devices. So we used, as I said, our Bright Pages um, app to build something that again, highlights the different sections um, as a starting point, um, sort of works on different devices, so it kind of shrinks and uh, resizes as you go on different devices to make sure that we engage everybody in this case. And then, um, as Daniela pointed out, um, we sort of let users guide their own story uh, and, and find their own ways through this. So let's say you're interested in great places and this is your starting point, you're not forced to start at any point. And um, as we sort of dive deeper into the document, we wanted to make sure that we have these sort of highlight pages that are very sort of infographic inspired and provide the content in sort of fun and visual um, elements. Uh, they make some of the strategies and uh, clickable and easy to explore. They provide content and some of the information in sort of charts that are sort of, again, sort of driving and visually pleasing to kind of dive into and explore further as well as using things like a before and after map to kind of compare different, like the trend scenario with the preferred scenario that they ultimately went with. Uh, again, sort of asking uh, questions is, is a helpful way to relay information and, and, and teach or provide, educate about different topics. So in this case, we added a sort of quiz to kind of test uh, and get some information across. And finally, uh, one of the key pieces here was to embed feedback right into this. So we have uh, a survey um, element that asks, you know, what's missing, what's currently happening that's relevant to this. And it sits right there instead of kind of making this a multi-step process. And then for the people, again, sort of that want to know more, there's a way to then sort of dive deeper into the content with an embedded PDF 
um, to kind of get the full information. But um, for everybody else, you can sort of invest in, in as much time as you have. Um, and so coming back to um, our sort of idea of how can we summarize some of these structures and structural elements uh, to make our plans fun to explore and, and engage with online, uh, a couple of things that we sort of learned through these projects is uh, the sort of navigation, free navigation, or um, pick your own adventure, as, as um, Daniela called it, is uh, is really interesting because we can you, uh, provide something to the users that uh, and participants that have five or ten minutes to give, and get them to the point where um, they find the information that they're most interested in, can provide their feedback, and if people have more time, can dive deeper into that, whether that's other topics or deeper deeper into the content. And so we've we've done this in different ways. Like we found that sort of, for example, in a corridor plan, structuring the different um, uh, design choices and, and design uh, so, um, elements of the plan by mode of transportation. So if you mostly walk down the corridor, you can go there and look at the different things that um, are done for your for you, or like depending on where you live, look at different. Um, different uh, areas of the corridor. But we found that sort of way of presenting content or collecting feedback to be very sort of more targeted and, and making the best use of people's time. Uh, another strategy or, or, or game dynamic is sort of this visual discovery, really um, using infographics um, to, to make it interesting to, to learn about certain topics and, and provide different ways into the content where you might start exploring this infographic or the content at one special area and then you sort of navigate from there and it drives you deeper into it um, to, to get different things across. And so as we um, uh, sort of look at the before and after, uh, or as we sort of look at uh, more visual and more sort of content, map-based content, uh, another strategy that stood out to us is uh, this it's an example from New York City where they showed some design options before and after, and you can kind of drag the slider above or across, and you kind of see the before and after picture and how they relate to each other. Uh, we saw this as an opportunity to do the same thing with maps, where oftentimes as planners with the technology that we have, we tend to you know build your typical map with 10 different layers and hope that users will know um, the right questions to ask and to and to learn from this by driving their own um, sort of exploration. But um, more often than not, we find this sort of to not be as effective as if we use the maps in a more specific ways to get the story across. And so uh, a before and after map comparing different trends uh, or different scenarios is a really great way to, to provide um, a feed or to provide that information in a way that's easier to explore and navigate uh, while sort of getting people closer to this step of answering a question that we define for them. Uh, another uh, obviously sort of bigger topic that I'm barely going to touch on here is sort of this idea that we uh, our work is very visual and, and obviously about the built environment and we want to make sure we provide uh, sort of models and, and 3D representations of the changes that we're doing and uh, things, tools like City Engine and, and others really get us to uh, our very powerful ways uh, and, and potentially in the future ways sort of game-changing ways to do uh, engagement or planning topics. Um, in the meantime, we find oftentimes our clients don't have the resources to dive that far into it, but they might already have, um, and you might already have, um, your plans and, and simple things using SketchUps for massive models or things like that that you already have in place and that in a printed document typically end up being uh, just a 2D kind of view even though the, you have the model in 3D. So, keeping it simple and just sort of pro presenting and, and summarizing uh, using those models to do 30 second, maybe a minute clips of, of different aspects of the model and embedding them into the content is, is a very effective low key and low cost tool to kind of uh, present that information in a fun and engaging way. Uh, the other thing that I already pointed out was um, question or quizzes uh, provide a fun way to get different information across and sort of provide alternative ways of learning again to kind of uh, get different points across. And um, uh, one example here that we've done in, in Little Rock, Arkansas was a state of the region report that one was kind of personalized based on some inputs you made earlier in the, in the process, but also um, <clears throat> asked 10 sort of tri trivia questions uh, along the tool and then allowed people to then afterwards sort of be uh, like, like winning prices based on sort of a leaderboard type um, uh, setup. And the last thing 
here is um, we need to keep in mind, and it's actually sort of inspiring for us, but at the same time, sometimes daunting is sort of this idea that people are using our um, websites and, and online content now from different devices. And so it provides a whole range of new and fun opportunities uh, in terms of uh, making the sort of content available and, and, and uh, apps and, and, and um, participation sort of activities that are uh, usable and, uh, and fun on, on mobile devices. And so part of this sort of one aspect is, for example, like your mobile phone using a, a, a mapping app on a mobile phone might allow you to just simply take the GPS location from that mobile phone and, and add that to the place so you can map while you're on the go. There's quite a few tools sort of emerging around that idea. Uh, the idea of having kiosks and having them in public places uh, or as Daniela mentioned sort of going out with ambassadors and having people do surveys on them is a great way to uh, but again requires to make content available in a very quick and very visual way with simple sort of design and, and user interface uh, things like sort of larger buttons and things like that. So there's a whole sort of lot around that that, that makes the experience uh, more fun. Another part, and that's sort of the second part here before wrapping up, is um, sort of engagement. This sort of how do we use the different the, the surveys, the simulations, the scenarios you want to put out and collect feedback on them. And so one example I want to highlight real quick is uh, we've been working with um, GDOT, the Georgia Department of Transportation, to help them with uh, public feedback on their uh, statewide transportation plan and so we built a tool that again was very visual and kind of getting across why, why we need um, to do this process and what we need to get out of it and then um, obviously learning about the different focus areas of the plan and as you sort of go through it um, you provide a little bit of uh, feedback information about yourself and then you um, dive into this budgeting exercise and it uh, it provides you with like sort of the main different uh, budget items uh, and sort of ask you to prioritize spending on uh, on these. And as you go along, you kind of see um, not only the budget, the overall budget change uh, up to the sort of $50 billion that they have over the time frame, um, but they also, uh, we, we reflect that with different trade-offs. So as you go, you not only see sort of um, how well you're doing sort of distributing the budget across the, your priorities, but you also see along different lines how well you're doing on certain uh, priorities and how others might not be as well um, taken care of. And so like this interplay of um, investment and playing with different choices um, along with uh, seeing not only the impacts, but the, or not only the sort of budget impacts, but diff different impacts kind of provide, the, provide this experience of uh, so, like helping solve a problem and kind of sort of de deliberating as you go through this exercise. And as you submit, you'll see um, how well you've been doing compared to others, which I think is another sort of key aspect of play here before you can then dive deeper into uh, providing more feedback uh, about specific areas of the plan. And so um, coming back, sort of what does that mean? How, what can we learn from this? And sort of what, uh, what build blocks can we really sort of extract from that that might be useful elsewhere? And I think one of the key aspects here is that um, as human beings, we're wired for problem solving. So like presenting um, feedback options in a way that they're um, presented as a challenge uh, leads to a lot better feedback than if it was just sort of a survey where they can provide sort of pie in the sky kind of ideas um, without having to ground them or, or sort of consider the trade-offs in a sense. And so we've seen this, we've done a budgeting exercise with the city of Denver here where uh, two years ago, we helped them um, collect feedback on how to solve the budget gap. And so a lot of the choices that were uh, available to fix that budget gap um, had different impacts. And so uh, people could go in and kind of make choices and see how well they're solving this and, and sort of change their mind and tweak it as they sort of went along. Uh, another example is we're doing this with MSU or Metro State University here in Denver right now is they want to sort of accomplish a certain level of water savings with their students. And so we have uh, create a pledge tool where students can say, okay, I'm willing to do X and Y and play with a couple of different options that they could personally do to save water and then you multiply that. And so you can see at the, uh, the school level, if 20,000 students would do the same thing, this is what we would accomplish and how close we would get to reach those goals. Again, sort of a challenge, presenting it as a challenge and, and asking people to kind of provide um, their input on how to solve that challenge. And the other aspect that I already highlighted in the example is 
I think this sort of trying different things and, and not only optimizing one impact level, so the budget impact, but providing a range of other impacts is really helpful for this sort of deliberation process, the, not only asking for feedback, but to help people understand the trade-offs that are um, aligned with that and to then sort of get to the next level of saying, okay, maybe if we can't do X, I want to do Y. And, um, and really sort of using that in an effective way. Uh, a different sort of game approach that we've come across or that we had to think of was um, sort of using how do, can we make scenario planning uh, uh, easier to explore and, and, and fun to sort of provide feedback on. And so there's a, a couple of or a range of really great tools that um, model and allow people to play with this scenario model in, in sort of very in a very detailed a very detailed scale and seeing the impacts but oftentimes we find that our clients didn't have sort of the resources to go to that level um, and make all of that available so uh, what we took here was basically sort of we reverse engineered this in a sense of saying okay we have these three or four scenarios that were created throughout this process and uh, let's see where the main differentiators between those scenarios are and then as you can see in the middle, we ask them as questions so like what should be predominant form of growth or which area should we grow in? And based on the user's um, responses to that, they can see which of the scenarios they most closely align with. So again, it's a very simple, in a sense, scenario planning tool that doesn't go to the, the level of detail and also the flexibility of some of the larger models. But it also helped us to get something, to translate something into a fun experience that otherwise is very resource and, and, and uh, uh, time intensive to put out to the public. And so um, an example that uh, many of you know who have like uh, seen some mind mixer engagement processes is our, our leaderboards. And I'm just I'm showing an example here that we just wrapped up this week, which was a learning uh, landscape or a learning environment um, uh, engagement process uh, for a large university in, uh, in Australia. And um, we asked students to submit, submit the places that they like on campus where they um, where they study and, and ask a couple of other questions around those places. And so um, it was fun to see basically there were some prices to be um, won, some free coffee for a month, and uh, depending on your participation. And we used this sort of leaderboard approach to give out um, sort of different points for comments or for submitted places. And, uh, and at the end of the day, um, some students won based on their points and others based on the best content available. And the really interesting thing I think here is that incentivizing this brings up a whole range of other questions that you need to keep in mind from um, how do we um, avoid that people, like the, the quality goes down in content, that we get low quality feedback because people are trying to get more points. Uh, so there's some other aspects that we want to take into consideration. Um, but it's an effective way to kind of drive participation and get more people involved. And last, one thing that sort of fascinates uh, or that I, I think is a driver that we see more and more is um, uh, playing with uh, curiosity, so promising people before they participate that they can see how they compare to others and using that as, an, uh, as another sort of incentive of uh, ask, like them providing feedback to us and then sort of learning what, what their choices compare to uh, in terms of the region or city or whatever level you're working at. And, uh, another tool that does this really well is um, CrowdGage, that, a tool that Place Matters along with others uh, sort of maintain and provide. Uh, in that case, it's even as detailed as on the regional level. And you can sort of kind of see different places around the region uh, both differently. And so you can kind of see how their priorities are different. And that also is kind of the segue into um, turning it over to Brad. As I mentioned, this uh, is what, what I just went through, these sort of game dynamics that, I've, that we feel are applicable to planning processes, planning documents, uh, planning engagement activities, I think are you know, just sort of our lessons learned to this point and far from complete, especially since we didn't even touch on some of the crowdsourcing and, and, um, and, and other sort of engagement tools that are more commonly used. And so it's, it's one of our desires to kind of uh, collect more of those. And if you have other examples that you think we should take a look at or some things that worked or didn't work, please feel free to reach out. We also uh, host a, uh, an online magazine called Engaging Cities where we share these experiences. And so if you have a project you're working on that you're really excited about that you think is along these lines, let us know. We'd be happy to kind of feature that. And with that, I'm going to um, get out of this. Um, presentation and turn it over to Brad. One second here.
Okay. Well, do next. All right. Can one of the other uh, presenters confirm that you guys are seeing my screen? Yep. Look okay? All right. Great. Well, thanks, everybody. You know, the benefit of going last is that you can, um, you can skip a lot of stuff that you otherwise have to say. So uh, what I'm going to focus on is kind of continuing the pattern so far of kind of drilling into more examples. Um, so just quickly, a little bit about Place Matters. We're a nonprofit, um, also based out of uh, Denver, Colorado, like Chris, um, an inter urban interactive studios. Um, and our focus is really on how do we use technology and tools to inform the decision-making process. So this is a, a topic that we are dealing with daily, and um, so I'm really excited to be a part of this group. What I'm going to dig in today are two and maybe three tools, if I have time, um, that sort of operationalize and give example to a lot of the concepts that we've been hearing about today. Um, one of those that I want to sort of call attention to first is the idea of experiential learning. People learn in lots of different ways, and oftentimes we teach didactically, we tell people things, um, but learning experientially is learning by doing, learning by playing with ideas and seeing systems work and interact um, can be a really great way of dealing with the sorts of systems that we as planners typically deal with, which are complex systems. And one common application that we have worked on is how do you communicate the trade-offs of different decisions. In many ways, that's the crux of what planners do, as we try to help communities understand the trade-offs of different decisions and then use that information to hopefully make better decisions about the future. So the first tool I'm going to present on today is one that um, Chris alluded to, which is called CrowdGage. CrowdGage was originally developed by Sasaki Associates for the Des Moines region. And the idea behind CrowdGage was to, for a large, large metropolitan area to help people express their preferences for how they would like to see the future unfold, but to also uh, grapple with the trade-offs that are involved in those preferences that they're expressing. And so I'm just going to walk through the website and go through it and do a kind of deep dive, and I'll be sort of narrating along the way what's happening from a sort of um, experience design and sort of um, user design sort of learning standpoint. So when you first go to the screen, it looks like this. Um, and I'll be clicking through some of the information pop-ups because I'll be narrating it for you. So you enter in some yeah. details, and I'm just going to go through and do that real quickly. And you'll notice that we have the prefer not to say option. That was really important so that we could maximize the number of people um, who are participating. Um, and so once you enter it, we first sort of start out by asking you to tell us what are your priorities. So this is a kind of typical regional visioning sort of exercise. And so the rules of this are that you can allocate up to 35 stars. So by having that up to number, we're sort of forcing people to prioritize. And this is a sort of common technique to help people deal with limited resources. And then you'll see that this is taking into account a lot of the principles and the ideas that uh, Daniela and Chris presented on. So we're using icons um, and symbols to help people understand um, the, the complex ideas. When you hover over them, um, it sort of unpacks them a little bit. So for example, the road system, utilities, and internet in my community are sufficient to attract and retain businesses. Is that a, a vision that's really important to you or a priority for you that's really important? And so as you allocate stars, I'm just going to go through and do this while I talk. Um, the icons are going to resize, and I'm hoping that this is coming through okay to you guys. The internet connectivity makes this a bit dangerous of, a, of an activity. But um, as you move those stars um, in, on your computer, it's going to sort of resize things and show you how they relate. And you can see that it's relative. So I put five stars to I can easily stay in my home as I get older, and those two elderly folks, um, that one's bigger than the four stars that I just gave to a variety of arts, music, and cultural events can be found in my community. And so similarly, you can go through, and as I'm doing this, you'll notice that on the bottom left, um, it's telling me how many stars I have left. So I can kind of go through, and I can sort of make decisions, and as Chris said, there's a trial and error element to it. If I decide well, actually keeping taxes low, making that important, maybe that's not so important. So you can give those stars back, and it's going to go back to size. Another thing that was really important for this project was to have multiple languages. So all of this can be translated um, into Spanish. In this case, that's the major um, additional language community in the region. But I'm going to go back to English because my Spanish is poor um, and finish sort of filling this out. So this first piece is just about getting people's preferences. And 
doing it in a way that's visually compelling and easy for them to sort of see at a glance sort of what the landscape of preferences and priorities looks like. So I've now used up all my stars. I'm going to go to the next page. And you'll notice I get more instructions. So this is a participatory budgeting exercise that they call put, it, put your money where your mouse is. Um, and so this time you've got 20 coins to spend. Each coin represents the relative costs within a fixed budget. So things like um, increasing building space for new businesses as part of an economic development plan is going to cost you more coins than um, something that might be uh, fairly inexpensive, like a policy change, like reducing rate of teen pregnancy or something along those lines. So I'm going to go ahead and just go to it. Um, you'll also notice one of the ideas that Chris presented about leading people through things and sort of telling them how they're sort of stepping them through the process is happening whoops, up at the top here where it's the priorities, which we just did, and then budget, and then we'll get to policies at the end. Now this time what's going to happen is you'll see that on the right, the things that I said were important to me, my priorities, we preserved the sizes of those, but we took away the color. And that's because we're going to use color to talk now about, um, about how the, the financial decisions you're making, the budgeting decisions, impact the things that you said were important to you. So for instance, when I hover over something, you can see it previews it. If the circle, if the icon turns orange, that means that it harms or doesn't really help my goal or my priority. And as it gets blue, it means that it does support it, that that kind of budgeting decision would support or help complement um, the priority that I said was important to me. So I'm going to go through and just sort of play with some of these so you can see um, some of the ideas here. So if I increase modern commercial and industrial building space for new and expanding businesses, that was a key idea in their plan, um, you can see that that did a lot to help um, things like keeping taxes low and um, protecting the natural environment and protecting rural character, but it didn't do much to help uh, the variety of arts and cultural events preservation. Now, why, how do we decide which things were helped and which things were hurt? That was basically decided on through um, previous rounds of civic engagement, talking to community leaders and stakeholders, and then the planners, the local staff, providing their expertise. So there was a lot of, a lot of analysis that sort of went into informing these decisions, but um, most of that was stuff that we could offload to small group discussions and other formats. And so we used this space and this format to really just help people get a quick snapshot view of how these budgeting decisions might impact things. So I'm going to continue to do that. And you can see that this is going to change the color of things. Um, it's going to blend them. So it's using color theory so that it's showing you how your overall um, spending decisions are impacting um, the things that you said were important. So, so far, the orange, my taxes are low, that's, that's really, I'm not doing a very good job of preserving low taxes because a lot of the things I'm putting my budget towards are things that would, according to our local staff there on this project, would require revenue increases or require tax rate changes. Um, so similarly, I could give these back and I could go through other ones and I could look at other combinations. And this idea of play and being able to try do trial and error things was really one of the things that was exciting about this tool for a lot of the people who were using it. Um, to Daniela's point, we use this oftentimes in small group settings on iPads. We would take it to a local chamber of commerce. We would take it to um, another local stakeholder group, and we would give them all iPads and have them do this exercise and then use it as a platform for discussion. They could ask questions like, well, I'm not sure I believe that, or, or well, if that's the case, maybe we should do this or that differently. And so the game itself really just became a starting point for these discussions and a starting point for learning um, about how these different trade-offs um, play into each other. So as, as you continue sort of going through this exercise, you end up with a map, basically, a sort of color-coded visual map of how the decisions you've made impact the priorities. Once you're satisfied with that, you click Next. And then we just ask a couple quick thumbs up, thumbs down things. So these are just policies that they wanted feedback on, that the local, that local staff wanted feedback on. Things like, should we establish a regional housing trust fund? And so if you choose yes, it, it again shows you how that would relate to um, the priorities you said were important. And again, this relationship is based on feedback that we got from local experts and stakeholders, as well as um, local expertise within the Regional Planning Commission. If you want to understand more about the policy, you can hover over it, and it provides those details on demand. Um, it'll tell you more about 
um, what that policy entails and what it would mean. And so again, this idea of layering learning and layering information so that people can get as much or as little information as they want but continue to play and explore ideas um, is kind of central to the idea of the game. And then once you're done with the game, um, in the live version, um, you could submit it. In this version, it's, we're already done, so you can't really submit it. But what we can do is we can show you what the results of the overall game looked like. So in the New River Valley, which is in Virginia, um, in Western Virginia, this sort of provides a lot of different ways that you can filter and look at how different communities, um, what they prioritize. And that was one of the really interesting out outputs of this exercise was that we, re we learned that the preferences really tended to vary by geography, by community, by demographics, because remember, we captured all that information at the very beginning. So we ended up taking the, the results of this game and producing a whole separate report for the local staff that really dissected and broke down all the preferences that were, ex that were expressed through the game and all of the um, ideas that had come out of the game. Um, we could break them out into all these different demographic groups geographic groups that we planners love to kind of pick at and dissect. And it really gave them a, a, a new understanding of the landscape of decision making that what would, might make sense in Blacksburg, which is the central sort of urban center with Virginia Tech and a lot of new businesses, that they're, what they needed and what they wanted, as they saw, it, was very different than what places like Dublin or Pulaski, which were small post-industrial towns, what they needed and wanted. And being able to see that reflected in the desires of the community really made it easier for local staff to then provide recommendations and have follow-up conversations. So that's one tool, um, and it's called CrowdGage again. Um, part of our work at Place Matters with Sasaki, the folks who originally designed the tool, was to convert it from a sort of proprietary sort of tool into one that's open source and based on code that's up on GitHub, which is a, a place to share code and freely available. And Place Matters has been helping communities get up and running with the tool um, who are interested in using it. Um, so if you're interested in that, please contact me and we can talk more about what that entails. Um, but it's been really interesting to see how the tool has been used in other places now. It's been used in several communities. And each time they can modify it and customize it to fit the issues and the trade-offs that they know in their community are most important, often informed by other analysis that's being done. So the other tool I wanted to talk about today really focuses on this question of how do we bridge offline and online engagement. So one of the issues, so Place Matters were located in Denver, and one of the issues that's a, a really important issue in Denver, like in many communities, is walkability. And oftentimes, um, trying to help communities understand the what are the features that make a place walkable or not walkable um, can be a, a, a difficult task. Um, we have a lot of tacit knowledge about what makes places walkable. And as planners, we have a lot of um, of very clear sort of knowledge and expertise about that. But how do you communicate that to people? How do you help them really start to get a, an understanding of that so they can become effective advocates um, in their community um, through their neighborhood associations, through local city council members, through other means? How can you really help them become effective advocates for the sorts of policies and um, capital improvements that might improve walkability? So these were the sort of questions we were dealing with when we partnered with Walk Denver, a local advocacy organization to develop WalkScope, which is what you're looking at now. So WalkScope is it's a mobile-friendly asset mapping um, uh, platform. It's built on top of Shareabouts, which is a, um, an open source mapping platform that was developed by OpenPlans, a, a great uh, nonprofit out of New York. And we took Shareabouts and customized it, modified it, and added some additional features to turn it into what you're looking at now. So the basic idea behind WalkScope is that it's really designed with a mobile first mentality. That is, it's designed to be used out in the field, out in the streets, rather than on a desktop. So what you're seeing now is one view of it, but it also scales down really nicely to um, a smartphone. So the basic idea behind WalkScope, like traditional asset mapping, is that you can um, go to a location, you can zoom in, and you can add a place. When you add a place, um, you drop the pen. So I'm going to drop it at our offices here in Denver, which are about right there. And then we first ask you, what do you want to record? You can do pedestrian counts. But more commonly, we've seen people doing sidewalk quality and intersection quality measures. So if you click on sidewalk quality, then you get a set of questions, a sort of standard survey. And the idea is that these questions were chosen partially because they help fill local data gaps in the city of Denver with data that they had but also because 
um, they allowed us to help lead people through what are the elements of walkability that are really important. So we asked questions about sidewalk obstructions, about sidewalk maintenance, things about lighting, safety concerns, traffic behavior, all the things that as planners we know can help the soft factors that can help make a place walkable or not walkable. And people fill this out, they can do it individually, sort of a typical crowdsourcing exercise, but what we've actually been doing more often is organizing with Walk Denver and other local groups and neighborhood associations and so forth. We've been organizing um, walking tours or, or rambles as they've been called here, which is where we get a group of, of four to 10, five to 12, somewhere in that range, people to kind of come with their smartphones and are led on a guided tour of a neighborhood. Um, and as they're going through the neighborhood, they're logging information. So we'll lead them through an early round of, of walk audit for a single block face. And then we'll have them split off into pairs or go off, off by themselves. And it's been really amazing. You can see some of the areas that we've been able to canvas really quickly. So if you look um, where my pen is right now, this area, um, was around a lot of light rail, um, sort of last mile connections for our new light rail development here in Denver. We wanted to understand what were the pedestrian conditions around those transit stations. And so we took groups of people from local neighborhood organizations who were interested in that out and we were able to capture a lot of really great information about it. Another thing that's nice about the tool is that people can um, submit photos like this one. And so that really helps people after the fact who are browsing this information to really start to get a sense of the look and feel of these neighborhoods and how they correspond to the more, the more sort of um, prescriptive sort of short answer questions that we're asking. You can also add comments. Uh, and we've seen that oftentimes this has been a way that people will start to um, engage with each other as residents in neighborhoods where they can agree, yeah, that is a problem, or they can say, actually, I think that's a, an asset to the community, having all the trees or having plenty of space to, uh, between, car, between the, um, the road and the sidewalk is actually really helpful there, or maybe it's not helpful, we would be better off with a wider sidewalk. And so you can see people start to engage with those questions um, in a way they might not otherwise. And then finally, we can take all that data and we can use it um, as a tool for for advocacy with local public officials to demonstrate where improvements are needed, um, but also just to build general awareness and understanding, a shared understanding about the pedestrian conditions and about the factors that really make um, walkability um, happen or not happen in a local place. So looking at the time, I'm actually not going to talk about the additional tool. I'm going to um, turn it back over to Christine. So Christine, I'm going to pass it back to you. Great. All right, let's jump into some Q&As for the next 20 minutes or so. Let me get my slide back up with some contact information. Yeah. All right. This first question is for Daniela. Um, what was the thought process for choosing Apple rather than Microsoft for your first example? Thank you. That's a great question. Um, I'll keep it short. It was. It was. Uh, I wanted to go to, to choose a brand or an idea that I thought people could uh, relate to pretty quickly. Um, uh, as kind of a computer geek, yeah, of course, there's a big, you know, Apple versus Microsoft rivalry that's been going on for decades. Um, but I, I think that at least historically, Apple has been um, more well known for for pushing the boundaries of design. You know, the first to make a handheld computer, um, the iPhone, um, the first to make a computer that wasn't brown or beige. Um, uh, uh, so, so yeah, definitely a controversial pick, perhaps, but I thought for a lay audience. Um, they'd, be, they'd get the idea pretty quickly. Great. Um, this next question, I believe, is for Chris. How do you work with clients to determine which engagement tools might be the most effective? Uh, good question. So I think from a company perspective, we're a little different than most tool providers that provide sort of one specific piece of software that is used at one specific time in, or phase during your planning process. And that we're sort of a hybrid consulting firm and have you know a couple of what we call st starter apps um, that we deploy. One of them is Brightpages that I mentioned. So 
Um, having been though a consultant uh, in the past, like I think our strategy is typically, uh, since most of the projects we're working on are full projects from start to finish, we want to make sure that within each phase you do something that gives you the feedback that you want at that point. So oftentimes early in projects we see a need for you know, a broader discussion or a broader crowdsourcing tool or something like that that helps you sort of with the vision and, and, and part and goals identifying that and then sort of later in the phase, uh, in later phases you might already have a couple of alternatives developed or a, pl a draft plan and so the discussion becomes sort of like how what are the different audiences that we want to engage at that point and sort of how do we present those, uh, that content that we have at that point. So it's usually sort of, I mean, it's, it's kind of a scoping process that sort of starts early on and typically we're a part of sort of finding a good, uh, or defining a public engagement strategy and then helping identify those pieces and see, you know, and, and discuss sort of what tools and what activities might uh, work at what, what stage. And so it's, uh, it's very sort of iterative and it's um, really sort of based on the uh, sort of an almost like a needs analysis, um, sort of what you envision at that certain point, what we're going to get out of it, and also at this, uh, and sort of balancing that with sort of the interest of the public, where uh, we don't see uh, the public as sort of data points, but we want to make sure that what we ask them is actually something that is fun, uh, fun to do, and, and at the same point, you know, it doesn't take up too much of their time, and obviously all these other considerations, and sort of finding a balance between them is usually sort of a, you know, a communication process. So I hope that that kind of addresses that. Great, thanks. Um, this next one is for Brad. Um, what resources were required to develop the new River City Area Interactive Survey? Uh, resource, time, uh, what was the budget for the community, the response rate, just a little more details on that. Sure, so the, um, so the initial version of the tool um, was called Design My ESM, and that was designed by, by Sasaki associates for Des Moines and I think the cost of that one was pretty expensive. It was it was upwards of I think seventy, eighty thousand, something like that. One of the things that we're seeing um, really become a common thing as as Chris alluded to is creating bot forms that can be sort of customized and then deployed um, that are based on a couple sort of common kit of parts so that you can dramatically reduce that cost. So that that price tag was to build it from scratch. When we deployed it in New River Valley um, we were able to do it for a fraction of that cost. Um, I could get the exact figures for the person if they're interested, um, but it was much, much, much less than that. It was it was on the order of you know I think 10k something like that. Um, I could get those numbers for you though. In terms of other resources, um, the way the crowd gauge works on the back end is that the matrix and so think of a spreadsheet and the column headers are the different. Um, priorities that people have, so those vision statements, I want a community where taxes are low, or I want a community where my children can walk to school, those sorts of things. And then down the rows, that is down the left-hand side, um, it has the, um, the, uh, the, um, the relationship between the costs, so those budget questions. And then each cell gets uh, from a negative two to a plus two, and that's how we are able to say what the relationships are between things. That's a little bit in the weeds, but the, it's by way of saying that the main challenge or the main task for the local staff was to work with us to fill out that matrix. And so that process was, um, the first time we did it, it probably took three to six months. That was a long time. The second time we deployed it, we cut that in half. It was closer to two months. Um, and so we think that we're getting faster and faster doing that. Um, it really depends a lot, though, as you can imagine, on how much um, information you already have about those relationships. Um, Interestingly, just as a quick side note, we found that that was something that we didn't realize would be such a, a valuable thing for the local staff, the clients, but they've actually, everyone we've worked with said that was really helpful for us to help us clarify the relationships between these things that we might have kind of had a fuzzy notion of, but having to put a number to it um, really helps them think it through and actually inform the planning process. So, so the sort of short version is, you know, it, it would cost, you know, 10K more or less and then, um, and then about uh, one to three months, depending on kind of how far along you are in the process of thinking through the trade-offs. Great. Um, this is for everybody. Um, and it, it kind of goes along with this last question about building the platforms and everything. So these platforms, are, are they created by you guys? And then, or, or do you go around and solicit these from other companies and then sort of add and curtail them 
to the specific municipality or area or whatever you're working with? Um, or did you do you use a lot of existing web services like SurveyMonkey, things like that? If you could go into a little bit more detail, for this is for any of you, um, just a little bit more on that. Um, Danielle here, I guess I'll go first. Um, we, yeah, we don't do development on staff, um, software development. What we do is website development when required, but we have a big database that, that it sounds like um, Chris and Brad maybe do something similar, but we have a big database of tools and partnerships with software companies um, that we go to, and we do a needs assessment as well. Uh, you know, what kind of skills the community have, what resources staff have, what the budget is, and what we're trying to accomplish um, with the information that we're gathering and what we want to communicate. And so we're a bit like inter intermediaries that, that pick, help, the, help our clients um, pick the tools and then um, use our communications and web skills to customize the tools and um, train staff on how to use them. Um, and then also we do a lot of work on the data analysis side as well. So I'll pass it over. Yeah, I'll go next and pass it back to Brad after that. And so uh, from our perspective, I mean, we're more a technology or a software firm and, and than probably what Danielle is doing. So we have a starter kit that's called Engaging Plans for Project Websites so that's sort of very affordable and, and is sort of a simple monthly subscription. And then typically on larger projects, we then sort of have a, a mapping app that we sort of maintain. It's called Vivid Maps and sort of very visual sort of image mapping tool um, that we sort of can bring to the table or, as I, said, I mentioned before, the Sprite Pages tool. And that's sort of if those are fit, you know. And, and so as similar to what Daniela said, we, we're not a sort of, um, we're not just focused on our tools, but we sort of have partnerships with other firms beyond that. And so if there's a fit, you know, for CrowdGage, well, we, we've talked to Place Matters about that before. We'll bring that into a project that we're working on if that's a good fit and, and does what the client needs and what, what we think is a good fit for what they're trying to get out of that. And so I think it's a mix um, of things just because many of the tools that are out there are very specific in what they accomplish. And so um, there might be a use for them in one project but not in another and being flexible and, and bringing to the table what, what is necessary to make the process uh, a success I think is sort of a, from our perspective more important than selling our own tools. And Brad, you, you might have a... Yeah, sure. So, so we're so as I mentioned earlier, we're a nonprofit. So our main goal is sort of idea dissemination and helping sort of lead the field uh, towards better use of the tools. So we have technical staff um, who can build these tools if needed. I'm one of those people. Um, but typically, what we do is we'll try to find existing tools or tool developers and um, build on top of what they do with our technical skills. So both of the examples I showed were um, use cases of that. So CrowdGage, we significantly modified it um, in-house, but it was a tool that already existed. And similarly, um, Wascope is the same sort of thing. That said, from time to time, we will build a custom thing from scratch. Um, but we typically only do that if it's a fairly light touch, easy thing to do. Um, and there's a significant gap in the marketplace. Because the reality is, there's so many great tools out there these days. Um, and so many of them, I would say, there's a general trend I, I'm seeing at least towards platforms rather than one-off custom solutions just because from the software developed side it makes it much easier and cheaper for them to, to continue to deploy those tools and a lot of the problems they need to solve um, are similar from community to community with customizations and changes made along the way. So we tend to like that idea and tend to look for platforms or existing tools that can kind of customize and hack for our own clients' purposes. Great. Um, this is for any of you. In, in your opinion, what percentage of a planning project budget is typically de dedicated to the development of online tools? Good question. Um, I mean, I've, in our experience, we've seen this range from you know, a very low percentage to something as high as maybe five or ten, but that's really sort of the top end of it. And I think that might be different in projects that are sort of very sort of specific in, the, in a sense. So like maybe there's a project around sort of regional scenario planning, and, and in that case, you know, there might be a significant part of the budget towards the tool development. But in your general comprehensive plan data, I would say it's much, much less um, 
and really again sort of depends on, on the needs and sort of how much existing tools can be used versus uh, sort of what the mix of tools looks like. Yeah, that, this is Brad. I, I, that number is similar to what I've seen in my experience and I think oftentimes the tools um, can get separated from the general communications elements of the budget like the plan, drafting, and those sorts of pieces and I think more and more the media that we display these things on or in um, has to be considered early and so I think I, I can see a world emerging in which um, we think about communications much earlier in the process, not just the kickoff and the final plan presentation, but along the whole way. And I think that's going to require us to rethink how much we are um, dedicating a specific line item budget versus sort of dropping it into each task with the, of the budget. Yeah, I think one thing to follow up on that that I see more and more is that, as Brad mentioned, the budgets of communications and these online tools being merged and, and in a sense. So like we almost get to a point of like saying, okay, what is the sort of cost per participant on different sort of things and so like as we sort of in these early phase sort of negotiations from a sort of process perspective how many, how many workshops are we going to have versus how do the workshops kind of work together with some of the tools I think the question becomes really quick is it efficient to have you know 10 or 20 workshops across the region or can we say okay we're going to do maybe half of that and sort of figure out other ways um, to engage citizens in these other parts of the region with using an online tool and then being now deploying some kiosks there to make sure that they get involved or mm -hmm. sending some ambassadors out. And so I think it's that that mix of things that I think more often sort of drives that conversation and, and the budget. Uh, Daniela here. I just want to flag some things to think about when looking at costs for tools. I might yeah echo what Brad and Chris said about the um, the cost for tools that I see the same five to ten range. Um, yeah, there's, there's the licensing cost, and there can be an order of magnitude difference. You know, online survey tool could be free, but often with the functions you might need, it might be $500 a year or even $1,000 a year for a license. Um, some other common online tools, their licenses could be um, up to $10,000 or $15,000 a year to use, um, as many times as you like. And there's some others out there that just use the tool one time. There's $10,000, and um, there's a cost to, to modify it. Um, if you want to use it again, but a little bit differently, that it could be half as much or a third as much. Um, and so then there's also the yeah communications and promotional and staffing costs on top of that. But if you're investing a lot in an online tool, then um, to make the most of it and uh, like the other guy said, get the good cost per user, um, then do as much as you can to, to raise awareness and spread the word and, and make sure that, that tool does get used. Okay, um, next question for any for anyone. Uh, can you comment on which tools are appropriate for a formal scientific survey as opposed to a starting point for community conversation, which isn't necessarily a, a valid you know scientific survey? That's a really good question. Um, I think that the, what Brad and uh, Chris showed was tools that did collect demographic data. And um, so for a scientifically valid survey, which is the way I'm understanding the question, um, what you're looking for is, um, yeah, it's difficult if you're doing an opt-in. If it's opt-in, um, then you're going to get a bias no matter what. Um, but uh, if you can look at the demographics of your community and then all collect demographic information from your tool, and reach um, a large percentage of the population uh, that, that's balanced with those demographics, then um, it'd, be, it'd be pretty close to, uh, to representative of your community. Um, but uh, that's, that's a good question. I'd like to hear what the other guys think as well. Um, but the way we you know, think of scientifically valid surveys are like phone call surveys um, or mail out surveys where it, it goes to absolutely everyone in the community. Um, uh, yeah, so it's definitely a challenge that we're facing as a profession of how to do this. But the way that we at least approach it is by looking at our community demographics and then measure, collecting that information and comparing the two. Yeah, I think that's a it's an excellent question. That's one that um, the project is going to show today. If it didn't, would have talked about a little bit because it's with some researchers, and so they needed for academic purposes, um, and it's a survey. Um, in the past, for projects, we've typically been we've typically been cautious about using online tools for scientifically val valid purposes because of, in the past there was still a lot more selection bias in terms of online users. 
um, that fears less, but we still tend to use telephone surveys um, for scientific uh, results, and then we'll do online tools and then compare the results and look for um, comparative similarities, things like that, um, as a way of trying to take advantage of the benefits of online tools, but um, anchor them back to um, kind of tried and true um, methods. So that was done. We were on, this, on the project team along with um, Chris Holler's uh, team for Planning T, the Tennessee one, and they did a, a telephone survey um, with the University of Tennessee there in Knoxville. So that's typically what we've done. Um, I, I think probably the more traditional survey tools like SurveyMonkey and the like would be your um, best bets um, just because of the simplicity and the uniform experiential qualities. Um, the sort of tools that I present today are designed more for engagement and in, um, and to be, and I think you can use those in conjunction with more sort of rote scientific um, tools. But I'm also interested in what Chris has to say. No, I think that, that actually captures it um, pretty well. I think uh, obviously uh, there's uh, one one sort of consideration in, in when you're using things like a Survey Monkey in the way that Brad suggested is that you could at some point sort of look in and say, okay, what do our demographics look like, and sort of compare them back to your community community demographics and say, okay, let's see who we're missing, and then as Danielle said, like certain groups in your community might not. Uh, sort of receive the outreach or be receptive to the outreach that you're currently doing. So you might have to send somebody there with an iPad and, and, and get their opinions and kind of making sure that you capture everybody. But uh, I, don't, I don't think you can get that to the point where it's, you know, scientific is uh, valid. I think you get to the point where, you get, when you're, where you're comfortable with the selection and cross-section of your community that you've reached. Um, but yeah, again, un unless you do something that is um, sort of completely random and, and, and like Brad said, mostly that's, that's phone surveys. I, like, I, I think you won't get around that. All right, great. Well, this brings us to 2.30. So I think we're going to close up shop for the day. Um, so Daniela Ferguson and Chris Holler and Brad Barnett, Thank you for joining us today. You, you all were great to work with. And thank you for the Colorado chapter for sponsoring today's webcast. And um, be sure to watch for the YouTube channel and for PDFs of these presentations should you want more information. Um, and I hope everyone has a great weekend. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.